Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 188 of the GDPR Weekly Show, the number one GDPR podcast worldwide. So coming up in this episode, we have news of a data breach of children's information on the Isle of Wight. We then have news of a ransomware attack at the Scottish Mental Health Charity. And staying in Scotland, a Tim Ross family has been awarded £2,500 after a school data breach. We then travel south to the Lake District, where Allardale Council has had a number of data breaches. And then we have the new information to Mr Jonathan Edwards, who's given his first major public speech. So we have some information for you on what he was speaking about and his views so far. We then have news that cryptocurrency customers have been affected by a data breach at HubSpot. And then news that Amazon workers in the UK, Germany, Poland and Slovakia have joined together to demand that Amazon gives them greater transparency on just what data Amazon holds on its employees. We then travel to Brussels, where the EU is proposing you know, new block-wide cybersecurity regulations. And then we travel to the USA, where four orthopedic organisations have had data breaches. And then to Massachusetts in the US, where CSI is facing legal action after data breaches. And then to Pennsylvania, where the Liberty of Oklahoma has had a data breach. And then finally this week, we look at just who is CAPSUS. CAPSUS have been one of the more active criminal groups in the area of data breaches so far this year. And so we look at who just might be behind the group. And so as always, a great mixture of articles for you this week. We hope that you find the information in the articles useful and informative. If you have any feedback for us, please do email us at feedback at ggprweeklyshow.com. We love to receive your feedback and we do read every single piece of feedback we receive. However, due to the volume of feedback, it's not always possible for us to respond to each piece of feedback individually. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. And we begin this week on the Isle of Wight where children's details have been sent out in a data breach. Personal data identifying dozens of children has been shared by a council in an email. The Isle of Wight Council email included an attachment with personal details of 90 families on the Isle of Wight. It was sent out to about 80 parents of Year 11 homeschooled students on Friday. The council has apologised and the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, has been informed of the data breach. In a statement, the Isle of Wight Council said, The council would like to apologise to all the families listed in the document that was incorrectly attached. It added, the email was recalled 20 minutes after sending, and a follow-up email was also sent to recipients asking them to delete the original email without opening it. An ICO spokesperson said people have the right to expect that organisations will handle their personal information securely and responsibly. The Isle of Wight Council has made us aware of this incident, and we are assessing the information provided. If we get any further update on this from the ICO, we will, of course, bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. To Scotland now, and a Scottish mental health charity has been hit by a ransomware attack. The ransomware cyber criminals have claimed responsibility for the hack, which led to more than 12 gigabytes of sensitive data being leaked to the dark web. The Scottish Association for Mental Health has confirmed that it has fallen victim to a ransomware attack that has affected its IT systems, including email and some phone lines. The association confirmed that the attack had taken place, but is still working to fully understand the incident. In a statement, the Scottish Association for Mental Health, SAMH, said it is currently dealing with an IT incident, which is affecting our colleagues' ability to receive and respond to emails across both our national and local service locations. Some of our national phone lines are also affected. Our local services are still reachable by phone and continue to support service users across Scotland. The data was spotted on the dark web containing more than 12 gigabytes worth of data belonging to the charity on Monday. The game behind the Ransom X ransomware strain claimed responsibility by adding SAMH to its victims list. The data includes sensitive information such as names, addresses, email addresses and passport scans. Onlookers have described the attack on the charity as disgusting. We are devastated by this attack, said Billy Watson, Chief Executive at SAMH. It's difficult to understand why anyone would deliberately try to disrupt the work of an organisation that is relied upon by people at their most vulnerable. Our priority is to continue to do everything we can to deliver our vital services. My thanks to our staff team who, under difficult circumstances, are finding ways to keep our support services running to ensure those they support experience as little disruption as possible. We are working closely with various agencies, including Police Scotland, This is an active investigation. 
we will continue to take the best expert advice to assist us in effectively dealing with the situation. We don't know at this stage how many individuals are affected by the breach or how long SAMH expects the disruption to last. The ransomware ransomware was first observed in 2018, but came to prominence in 2020 after a number of high-profile attacks on government departments like the Texas Department of Transportation. The ransomware is known for disabling security products to more easily infect the target machine. Ransomware started on Windows, but has more recently evolved to operate on Linux, although the Linux variant is less complex and lacks certain functionality like disabling security products. Ransomware is also a far less ransomware strain, usually delivered as a secondary in-memory payload without ever touching the disk. Other ransomware victims include Embraer, one of the largest aircraft manufacturers in the world, Japanese business technology company Kanita Minolta, and Brazil's Talk System in November 2020. Remaining in Scotland, and a mother and daughter won a £2,500 payout from Perth and Tinross Council after it admitted a data breach. Staff at Tinross High School illegally disclosed details about Emma Rose to an estranged relative on three occasions, despite her being an adult. Emma had returned to the school for a seventh year in order to complete extra qualifications so she should go on to study to become a vet. The data released included incorrect information about how many hours Emma was studying at school, causing problems for Emma's mum, Julie, in relation to child support. Julie then faced a tribunal with the Department of Work and Pensions over a claim of fraud because of the details provided by the school. Documents released as part of the tribunal allowed Julie to spot the data breach and the council's error. After a complaint, officials at the council admitted staff at the school disclosed information about what Emma was studying and when, without permission, breaching data protection law. A letter sent to Julie admitting the breach said, as Emma was an adult and not a pupil at the store at the time of the correspondence, no details about her should have been disclosed to a third party in this way. I would like to extend the Council's apologies to Emma for this data breach, which I know caused her distress. The procedures which the Council has in place to ensure the security of personal information were regrettably not followed on this occasion. The mistake was costly for Perth and Tinross Council, with Emma receiving £1,500 in compensation, while Julie was awarded £1,000 in compensation. A council spokesperson said, We wholeheartedly apologise to both Julie and Emma for the breakdown in our procedures which allowed the data breach to happen at the time and offer our apologies again. We continue to review, update our procedures and provide staff training in relation to such matters. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. To the Lake District now and it's been revealed that Allerdale Council has fallen foul data breaches 29 times in the last six years up to July 2021. The information was revealed by a Freedom of Information request submitted to Allerdale Borough Council by a member of the public, Jonathan Bull. Mr Bull had submitted the AE Freedom of Information request to a number of councils and organisations across the country as he conducts an investigation into cybercrime and data breaches. A number of questions were posed in the Freedom of Information request, including how many residents in Allerdale were affected. In a response sent in July 2021, the council was unable to say precisely how many people have been affected by the 29 breaches in total. This was due to document retention, but for those they have on record, 11 residents were affected by the breaches. Mr Ball said, Please send me a copy of correspondence that you sent to people affected by the data breach to notify them their data had been breached. The spokesperson for the council responded, There's no information held for these purposes as the breaches that were realised did not meet the threshold of official communication to individuals. Allerdale Council said in their response that they did not receive any complaints from victims of the breaches. The council was asked in the Freedom of Information request if they report all of their cases to the Information Commissioner's Office. In response, the council said, as we only maintain records of these breaches for three years following closeout, it's difficult to determine those older than three years from the current date. In recent times, there's been one reported to the ICO. The breach that was reported to the ICO was found to be sufficiently mitigated and required no further action as per instruction. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. The new UK Information Commissioner, John Edwards, has made his first public statement on GDPR since taking up the role and taking over from Elizabeth Denham. In his speech, John Edwards signalled a doubling down on privacy and individual rights as the government plans to overhaul GDPR and replace it with laws that prioritise innovation. The government is in the throes of the public consultation, which we've mentioned several times here on the GDPR Weekly Show. The consultation closed in November 2021 and the government is currently collating all the responses. The government aimed through the consultation was to radically redraw the UK's data protection landscape in light of desires to create a pro-growth regime 
the phrase was common sense over box ticking. Those against the idea of reforming GDPR were warned, though, that these proposals would erode the integrity of the layer of individual rights and protections ushered in with GDPR. John Edwards, who arrived from New Zealand in January to serve at the helm of the Information Commissioner's Office, however, has doubled down on the need for any future regime to respect citizens' fundamental rights to privacy. This chief concern, he said in his first public outing, trumps all other considerations. Mr Edwards told delegates at the IAPP Data Protection Intensive, the deep legal and cultural commitment to protect fundamental rights informs what comes next for us in the UK. I see the opportunities for the UK to shape its own laws and see a desire in government to promote innovation. I understand the entirely sensible goal of enabling business and government to derive a digital dividend and extract value from data, but all this will be built on a foundation that prioritises privacy. That cultural value of privacy has been reflected as I've met with organisations across the UK. Different sectors face different challenges, but I've heard a consistent message of organisations understanding the importance of getting privacy right. In his long-anticipated speech, Mr Edwards also repeatedly signalled the most important aspect of his approach would be preventing harm to individuals through illicit business practices, signalling again he would take seriously the British obsession with privacy. Mr Edwards struck a more diplomatic tone in his first speech, as Information Commissioner than previous comments may have paved expectations for. He once described Facebook, for example, as being morally bankrupt pathological liars who enable genocide, facilitate foreign undermining of democratic institutions. The new ICO's championing of privacy rights first and foremost, however, directly clashes with messages from both ministers and the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport officials in recent months who have branded the current regime unfit for purpose. In March last year, the then Deputy Director for Data Strategy, Implementation and Evidence, Phil Earle, said the next Information Commissioner would need to correct the imbalance favouring privacy rights. Ministers, too, have long seen GDPR as cumbersome for businesses and anti-innovation. A task force comprising hardline Conservative MPs last June presented a report to Boris Johnson urging him to ditch the need for consent to process data as well as the need for human oversight on artificial intelligence decision-making. Much of this work has informed the initial proposals that DCMS has put out for consultation. Although the plans have been significantly watered down, they suggest removing the need to appoint a data protection officer or DPO and will also allow organisations to access personal data with greater ease. Notably, Mr Edwards refused to be drawn on whether he agreed with the need to overhaul GDPR in the first place, though elsewhere stressed that while GDPR had its issues, he saw it as a how-to, not a don't-do. Based on conversation with DCMS officials, Mr Edwards, however, is confident that proposals won't erode privacy in the way that was first feared, nor would the new regime jeopardise the UK's adequacy agreement with the EU. Given DCMS are committed to maintaining high standards of protection, I struggle to see how legal protections will be less in Cardiff than is afforded to those in Copenhagen, Mr Edwards said. We are expert advisers and DCMS listens closely to what we have to say and calibrates advice to ministers as a result. There are aspects in the consultation paper that we're continuing to engage with DCMS on, continuing to try to understand the policy issue that ministers are trying to address and providing advice about the implications and alternatives to suggested approaches. We have sent an invitation to Mr Edwards to take part in an interview here on GDPR Weekly Show and we hope to be able to bring that to you sometime later this year. A data breach at HubSpot has sent ripples through the cryptocurrency industry. Approximately 30 crypto companies were affected including BlockFi, Swan Bitcoin and NYDIG providing an uncomfortable reminder about how much data CRM systems hold and the effect that a breach of them can cause. A road employee working at HubSpot, used by more than 135,000 customers to manage marketing campaigns and onboard new users, has been fired over a breach that zeroed in on the company's cryptocurrency customers, the company confirmed on Friday. The breach has rippled through the crypto industry. As of Monday this week, crypto lending platform BlockFi, Bitcoin purchasing the automation platform Swan Bitcoin, Bitcoin company NYDIG, peer-to-peer payments technology company Circle and cryptocurrency fund Pantera Capital had been affected. That list comes from the financial media outlet Blockworks, which has reviewed emails the companies have sent to customers, along with public tweets advising customers on how to stay safe. The damage was minimal, HubSpot said in a notification on March the 18th. The thieves exported data from fewer than 30 customer portals and it had already notified the victimised companies, it said. In a statement, HubSpot said, 
we take the privacy of our customers and their data incredibly seriously. HubSpot said it had learned on Friday that a bad actor had compromised a HubSpot employee's account, namely what sounds like one of the super admin accounts HubSpot has on both internal and external sides of its platform, and that the attack was focused on stealing data from its cryptocurrency industry customers. We have terminated access for the compromised HubSpot employee account and removed the ability for other employees to take certain actions in customer accounts, HubSpot said. On a Saturday, the day after HubSpot reported the breach, Swan Bitcoin reassured customers that it uses HubSpot for limited client communication and marketing data, not for financial information transactions or other sensitive personal or financial information. You don't have to do anything, Swan reassured its customers. Your funds are safe. Your Bitcoin is not at risk. But then on Tuesday, Swan followed up with more details uncovered in its forensic investigation. It turned out that 0.2% of the data set included a limited historical snapshot of deposits in US dollars. The company said it's conducted a post-mortem to ensure that that slippage won't happen again. In addition, about 1.2% of the data set included clients' intended investment areas or the median net worth of their approximate geographic locations. All of this sensitive data has been removed from client communication services, Swan said. HubSpot said some employees have access to HubSpot accounts which allow certain employees, such as account managers and support specialists, to help out customers. In this case, a bad actor was able to compromise an employee account and make use of this access to its support contact data from a small number of HubSpot accounts. HubSpot have not yet confirmed precisely what data has been taken, but it's possible that it includes IP addresses, email histories, customer browsing behaviour, mailing and or shipping addresses, internal customers' financial value, and any deals that the company may have done. If we get any update on this from HubSpot, we will, of course, bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Amazon warehouse workers from Germany, the UK, Italy, Poland and Slovakia have filed access requests under Article 15 of GDPR to find out how the tech giant treats workers' personal data under GDPR. The workers have been supported in this by the UNI Global Union, the International Federation of Service Unions and privacy non-government organisation NOYB.eu. Amazon may be one of the largest corporations in the world, but they cannot use our data to feed an algorithm, then start firing people right and left or doing whatever they want with our data. As workers, we have a right to privacy and we have a right to know, said Andreas Gangel, a shop steward for the German union Ver.dl, and one of the workers filing the request. Workers are so far left in the dark about the use of their data despite Amazon using sophisticated systems to monitor workflows. Amazon has one month to respond and fully disclose their processing of workers' personal data. The combination of Amazon's voracious appetite for data alongside its anti-union behaviour is deeply troubling, said Christy Hoffman, General Secretary of the UNI Global Union. This is a company that we know has spied on employees and workers have the right to know if video and audio recordings, social network information, trade union membership status and or any other data collected by Amazon is being used against them in violation of GDPR. It is known that Amazon conducts background checks on workers and constantly monitors their work performance through a variety of invasive tools. But workers are left in the dark about what happens with the data. Workers receive little or no information about the intensive tracking that shapes their reality in the Amazon warehouse day in and day out. They do not know what kind of information is selected, for what purposes and who it's shared with. Workers are not aware if a privacy policy exists, let alone if any form of automated decision making about their future in the warehouse is being made based on the tracking data. Under Article 13 and 14 of GDPR, any EU or UK citizen has the right to be informed about the processing of their personal data. In a united approach, Amazon warehouse workers from five European countries have now filed access requests to clarify whether the company uses workers' data to foster inhumane working conditions and unsafe productivity rates. This is a classical case of information and control asymmetry. On one side, we have a private company collecting massive amounts of personal data, and on the other side, we have individuals caught in the current and economically dependent on their jobs. We are trying to lift this imbalance through coordinated access requests, said Stefano Rossetti, data protection lawyer at NOYB.eu. Amazon has a history of neglecting workers' rights. According to a report from UNI Global Union, On the intrusive and all-encompassing Amazon workers' surveillance systems, Amazon's highly invasive and ultra-fast delivery process is hiding harmful effects on its 1.3 million workers. 
Employees are relentlessly monitored, evaluated and subjected to high pressure and grueling conditions. This model is so inhumane that in the New York Times recently reported Amazon burns through workers so quickly that it's actually worried they'll run out of people to employ. Bloomberg News also reported that Amazon drivers have been fired by the app for minor mishaps that a real manager would have ignored. UNI Global Union has long been an advocate of ethical data collection and algorithmic management. In 2017, the Global Union issued principles to govern workplace data and has launched an initiative to curb abuses of management by algorithms through collective bargaining. Representing more than 20 million workers in 150 countries, UNI Global Union is driven by the responsibility to ensure skills and service jobs are decent jobs and that workers' rights are protected, including the right of union representation and collective bargaining. NOYB.EU, the European Centre for Digital Rights, is a non-profit organisation committed to the legal enforcement of European data protection laws. So far, NOYB has filed more than 600 cases against numerous intentional infringements, including companies such as Google, Apple, Facebook and Amazon. NOYB.EU is funded by its more than 4,600 supporting members. If we get any update on this either from the UNI Global Union or from Amazon, we will of course bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. The EU is proposing a new block-wide cybersecurity regulations. The Computer Emergency Response Team for the EU Institutions, Bodies, Offices and Agencies, CERT EU, will be renamed as the Cybersecurity Centre. The cybersecurity regulation will extend the mandate of the Computer Emergency Response Team, which will be renamed to Cybersecurity Centre, to EU institutions, bodies, offices and agencies. For simplicity, the Cybersecurity Centre will retain its widely used CERT EU acronym. The proposed regulation will also see the creation of a new interinstitutional cybersecurity board that will be responsible for steering CERT EU, as well as driving and monitoring the implementation of the newly proposed regulation. Under the cybersecurity regulation, all EU institutions, bodies, offices and agencies will be required to have cybersecurity frameworks for governance, risk management and control, conduct regular assessments, implement plans for improvement, as well as notify CERT EU of any instance without undue delay. In addition to the cybersecurity regulation, the European Commission has also proposed an information security regulation that aims to modernise the EU's InfoSec policies by taking into account the recent advances in digital transformation and remote working. The Information Security Regulation will see the creation of an inter-institutional information security coordination group that will foster cooperation across all EU institutions, bodies, offices and agencies, as well as establish a common approach to information categorisation based on the level of confidentiality. Commenting on the proposal, the EU's Budget and Administration Commissioner, Johan Hahn, said that in a connected environment such as the EU, a single cybersecurity incident can affect an entire organisation. This is why it's critical to build a strong shield against cyber threats and incidents that could disturb our capacity to act, he added. Han described the newly proposed regulations as a milestone in EU cybersecurity information security landscape, adding that they were based on reinforced cooperation and mutual support amongst EU institutions, bodies, offices and agencies, and on a coordinated preparedness and response. This is a real EU collective endeavour, he said. To America now, and four orthopaedic practices have reported data breaches in quarter one of 2022. The data breaches in total are believed to have affected more than 200,000 individuals. In Jacksonville, Florida, Jack's Spine and Pain Centers is probing a January ransomware attack involving patient data files. The data breach affected patient files created before May 2018. Remaining in Florida, and Florida Spine and Joint Institute in Boca Raton issued a data breach notice to patients after it found someone had unauthorized access to an employee email account. The data breach was submitted to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on January 21st and affected 61,595 individuals. In Indiana, Marion-based Indiana Orthopedics suffered a data breach that may have exposed the protected health information up to 83,705 individuals. On March the 7th, the practice began sending data breach notifications to all individuals as information was contained in the affected files. And then in New Jersey, Oradell-based New Jersey Brain and Spine was the target of a cyber attack. More than 92,000 patients were affected according to HHS data. New Jersey Brain and Spine began notifying affected individuals on March the 20th. We'll bring you updates on all of these data breaches when we have them available. 
remaining in America and four parallel data breach lawsuits have been filed against a 45-year-old background check service company based in Massachusetts. Creative Services Inc., located in Mansfield, provides background screening, drug testing and security consulting services to employers, institutions and governments in the United States and overseas. According to an official filing by the company on November 26, 2021, CSI detected suspicious activity on its computer systems. The company then learned that an unauthorised individual had gained access to the company's network and may have copied certain files dated from November 2018 to November 2021. By the end of January 2022, an investigation into the activity had revealed that personal identifiable information belonging to CSI clients had been compromised in the security system. Data impacted by the incident included names, dates of birth, financial account numbers, social security numbers and driver's licence numbers. In February 2022, CSI began mailing out data breach notification letters to individuals whose information was contained in the breach files. As many as 164,673 individuals may have been impacted by the breach. We have taken this incident and the security of personal information seriously, says CSI in a notice of the incident. While we have existing safeguards in place as part of our ongoing commitment to the privacy of personal information in our care, we are working to implement enhanced security measures. CSI offered complimentary access to 24 months of credit monitoring, fraud consultation and identity theft restoration services to impacted individuals. The company's breach discovery came two months after CSI notified over a thousand individuals that their personally identifiable information had been obtained by unauthorised persons in a separate data security incident. Earlier this month, four lawsuits were filed, each attempting to establish a class action case against CSI. The plaintiffs alleged that the company failed to effectively protect the personally identifiable information of the people whose backgrounds it was hired to check. In the most recently filed suit, plaintiff Santos Acosta of New York accuses CSI of recklessly or negligently failing to implement and maintain adequate and reasonable measures to ensure that the personally identifiable information was safeguarded. Acosta further claims that CSI failed to follow appropriate policies and procedures regarding data encryption. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. To Pennsylvania now, and on February the 17th, Liberty of Oklahoma, a health and human services company based in Balakilnid, confirmed a data breach stemming from a hacking incident. While details about the Liberty of Oklahoma breach are still forthcoming, it appears that the breach has exposed the sensitive information of as many as 5,746 individuals. We have approached Liberty of Oklahoma for a comment, and we will bring that to you as soon as we have it here on the GDPR Weekly Show. And finally this week, we end with a look at probably the most prolific cyber criminals of 2022, the Lapsus Group, who have largely evaded identification for months despite being anything but secretive in the way that they worked. The likes of NVIDIA, LG, Microsoft and Okta are among the most notable victims of Lapsus in the space of just three months. And up until late March, very little has been known about the group. Unlike most of the successful hackers in recent times, Lapsus is unique. It doesn't operate a ransomware model. Instead, it deploys other tactics to extort victims through financially motivated campaigns. Since the most recent supply chain attack on identity and access business Okta, the group has announced it will be taking a hiatus. But the inner workings of Lapsus will be studied by cyber criminals long after the group ends for good. So who's behind Lapsus? Well, perhaps the biggest uncertainty is that no one's quite sure. Onlookers have been left perplexed by the group that appears to be both competent and incompetent at the same time. On the one hand, the group has claimed numerous high-profile scalps that even the most experienced cyber criminals would be proud to hang from their mantle. But the group also displays a gung-ho approach to operational security. Rather than hiding in the shadows, it advertises its activity for all to see via a public telegram channel and even offers channel members a way to vote on which company's data should be leaked next. So it's almost putting gamification into the whole process. Researchers at Checkpoint said Lapsus hackers are Portuguese and are from Brazil, saying its first major breach was in December 2021, the month in which the operation started, and targeted Brazil's Ministry of Health and other government agencies. However, a separate report in Bloomberg suggested that the entire operation is being led by a 16-year-old based in Oxfordshire in the UK, with other members also being in the UK and Brazil. UK law enforcement made seven arrests on the 24th of March in connection with the Lapsus Group, and the City of London Police wouldn't immediately confirm if a 16-year-old was included. The seven arrests included individuals aged between 16 and 21, 
they were all released without charge, but investigations remain ongoing. A breakthrough piece of research published by Microsoft in March 2022 detailed the company's investigation into the group, uncovering the inner workings of how it operates and how it was able to breach some of the biggest organisations on the planet. Microsoft made no reference to who was behind the group or where it was based, but said Lapsus was a large-scale social engineering and extortion campaign operating on a pure extortion and destruction model. Microsoft said the attack methods used by Lapsus were varied, elaborate, and some were used less frequently than others by more mature threat actors. The social engineering tactics displayed by Lapsus gave the hackers intimate knowledge of employees and companies, Microsoft said. The goal of the group is to gain elevated access to businesses through stolen credentials that enable data theft and destructive attacks, often with a corporate extortion element. The group was observed calling help desks, convincing them to reset account credentials after studying how they work, and dropping into crisis communication channels in platforms like Slack and Teams. This required the hackers to breach a company to understand how they respond to a security incident, respond in a way that helped them evade detection. Lapsus achieves initial access through a variety of methods, including deploying the red line password stealer and searching public code repositories for exposed credentials. It's also been found to have bought business credentials, perhaps through initial access brokers, an observation corroborated by ransomware gang Arvin Club. In other cases, Lapsus simply paid company employees directly for access, a tactic it openly advertised on Telegram. The cyber criminals use remote desktop protocol, RDP, and virtual desktop infrastructure, VDI, such as Citrix, to remotely access a business's environment. Lapsus bypasses multi-factor authentication using techniques such as session token replay and spamming genuine account holders with multi-factor authentication prompts after stealing their passwords. The group said in the Telegram chat channel that spamming multi-factor authentication prompts while employees are sleeping is likely to get people to approve the attempts in order to shut off the notifications. Microsoft said Lapsus also used virtual private networks, VPNs, intelligently and in a way that demonstrated the criminals understood how cloud monitoring services detect suspicious activity. For example, it said Lapsus chose local address points to prevent impossible travel alerts from being triggered. The group also created virtual machines on victims' cloud infrastructure to launch further attacks before locking the business out of its cloud platform entirely. Once Lapsus had achieved total control, it would ensure all the organisation's inbound and outbound email was forwarded to its own infrastructure, where it would harvest as much data as it could before deleting systems and resources. At this point, in some cases, Microsoft said Lapsus would then either extort the victims to prevent the release of the data, or simply post the data online. An unveiled analysis of what is thought to be one of the wallet addresses associated with the Lapsus group by cybersecurity researchers Suflain Tahiri has revealed a total revenue of £123.9 million, pounds, all in Bitcoin. The finding has not been confirmed by Lapsus or any other entity involved in investigations into the group, although details of the group's cryptocurrency wallet address were made available to members of its Telegram chat channel. So whilst they may be taking a hiatus at the moment, we think Lapsus are definitely one to watch as we move on through this year, and it will take a coordinated effort of major organisations to prevent Lapsus gaining control of other companies' networks. We will, of course, keep you updated on any of the latest news on Lapsus right here on the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurer production. Until next time, bye-bye.